Okay, before we start with our, our weekly visit with Ryan Divish, I'll brought to you by Chalet Bowl here on Friday, April 26. Divish, it's it's been kind of one of those travel days for you, right? Yeah, it's um it's been special. Um so I I got up early, you know, like I, I scheduled trying to save the company about two or three hundred dollars. I got I took a little later flight knowing Adam Jude could cover the first part, like the, the pregame stuff, not right the game stuff. So now I get to DFW. Well, I was going to go to DFW and, and I had to grab a bag because my suitcase was a little wonky and I was worried that it might break. So I got a bag, like a duffel bag, and that took a little bit of time because it's biblical rain and tornado warnings right now and thunderstorms. So I'm like, oh. So I finally get to the airport, get to DFW, drop off the rental car. Got to get gas because HR makes you get gas instead of using the gas option because these people have never traveled. And so, um, anyways, <laughs> get to check my bag, and it says you're in the wrong airport. And I look at my phone, and I realize that I had booked my flight out of Love Field instead of DFW. So... I have to go out, get an Uber, and get to love. And just about the time that I'm going to get in my Uber, the skies opened up and drenched this place like Noah's Ark was waiting. And so I'm soaked, throwing my stuff in, because the Uber driver just pops the back of the vehicle and makes me do this. And then... Uh, I yeah, they, so, they can't be bothered with doing anything. <laughs> I mean, you know. I mean, like, I don't blame her. I mean, it was freaking miserable. So, throw my stuff in, you know, then you're driving in torrential downpour. She couldn't get out of DFW. She couldn't figure out how to do that. So, I had to instruct her how to get out of DFW. And then, uh, finally get to Love Field. And she lives there. Yeah, I had to get to Love Field and get everything checked in. And so, um, Tornado Watch is still going. I don't even know if my flight's on time. It says it is, but I don't know if I believe it. So, where where are you doing? Where are you do for those listening here on the podcast on Apple and Spotify and wherever you find your podcast and those who are watching you can where are you doing this this show from is it just are you at a bar where are you just sitting at the oh, gate where are you I'm quite literally at a table in the middle of the food court people are walking by staring at me um, there's a Chick Fil A with a line around the corner like every Chick Fil A for right. I think are pretty mediocre chicken sandwiches. There's a Whataburger, which I'd like to go to, but too. So, uh, yeah, it's been a, and this is not the first time I've done this thing with DFW Love Field. And I've done it at least twice. So I'm an idiot. I'm a little bit, but this happens when you've flown as much as I have and stuff. I've had the the PM thing. We book something PM instead of AM. It's, it's all. It's one thing or another. Hey, it, it's loud in there. Move, move the mic a little bit closer to you if you can. Okay. Is this better? Yeah, there we go. Perfect. There you go. Yeah. See, we're producing on the fly. The uh, Okay, so you've gone through some, you know, the la one of the last times I was in Dallas was with your good friend Bob Condota of the Seattle Times. Oh, yeah. Covering the Sonics. And we were in, we just got done with the NBA, the, G, the GM meetings or whatever, whatever they were, the owners meetings where they were voting on the, the the sale of the Kings. And so it's me and Bob and other people from Seattle were there and we're in Dallas and they, we had to hunker down in our room, actually go into the storm, um, the storm basement at the hotel because there was a tornado warning in Dallas and like a big one was coming. It was crazy. Oh, yeah. Like there, I think on my drive to DFW, the radio stopped and the emergency services came on three different times. I'm like, yeah, I get it. I'm driving into the circle of hell. Just, you know, I don't need, just let me listen to my music. So, oh, the things you do for your job, huh? I mean, like I, you know, the travel thing, you would think I'd be better at it and I, I'm usually pretty good, but lately <laughs> I've been kind of booking things quick and trying to rebook and I don't know. Oh, there's a guy in an Eastern uh, Eagle shirt. I should boo him right now. <laughs> Let's go again. Say go Grizz when he walks by. You know, oh. shout it. All right. Well, at least you saw some decent baseball for the series down in Texas, huh? Yeah, it wasn't bad. They played better. 
I, I mean, honestly, they won like, two games. They won two games with with basically zero offense, which I'm yeah, just and, and, amazed how they did it. And they won the the last game without Cal or without JP Crawford in the lineup, and Cal Raleigh all knocked up on painkillers trying to play through it. So I mean, like, you know, it's I mean, but that's you know, over the course of a season, we always do the old adage: you're going to win sixty, you're going to lose sixty. The games that they won here were games that should have been fallen into the lose sixty category, you know, and they found oh a way for to sure, win. and and that's what puts you over the top. And I mean, you know, anybody who thinks that that starting pitching doesn't matter, you look at what they've done. It's it's just been huge. Well, I mean, the starting pitching was great. Uh, Castillo's performance in, in that final game, but you're right. I mean. For them to get victories in some of these games, I mean, the two of the games that they won, I mean, they they didn't do much offensively. I mean, the last game they got five hits in the game, but but you know, timely hits, and they didn't have to score much because uh, their their pitching was so good. But I, I'm just it, it amazed. Listen, these guys play through injuries all the time, and people are going to say, "Well, all he had was you know dental surgery," so get over it. I mean, anyone that has had oral dental surgery knows how miserable like tooth pain is the fact that he missed what one game had yeah. emergency surgery comes back in place uh just remarkable love that guy i love cal raleigh to death Fair pot? yeah well yeah it, it, like look he had a fractured tooth down in the base level into his jaw <laughs> his face was swollen up like it was pain all the way down into his neck and like you can't talk you don't you know he was having trouble swallowing and drinking anything I mean, like, what the hell? Like, I don't care what anybody says, you know, break your tooth and then go try and do your job and then, like, don't do anything about it for a couple of days and try and just power through. I mean, like, this guy played with a fractured thumb and torn ligaments in his thumb, and he said that this yeah. the tooth was worse pain. So I'm going to take him in his word for it. Uh, yeah, that's just it. He's incredible. Uh, it's just the, the, the stuff that these guys play through. But, yeah, playing through that um, uh, certainly uh, – Commendable there by Cal Raleigh. What what's the deal with uh with JP? So ten day IL with the oblique strain, which I don't know where my obliques are. I know it's a great joke, but uh is he gonna be out longer? I mean, service kind of gave like ah, I really don't know how long he'll be out for. He's on the ten day IL now, but could it be could it be longer than those ten days? How bad oh, yeah. how bad a shape is he in? Usually it's a month with an oblique strain. Because oh. like with uh. baseball, you're just there's too much rotational stuff that you have to do and it affects everything. And so, and you know, people are like, Oh, it's just an oblique or whatever. First of all, you're talking to somebody who tore his oblique off his rib cage. And it was a single, you know, I've cracked some ribs, you know, I've had a lot of injuries in my life and this, and my, when I tore my oblique, it was the worst pain I've ever endured. So like I just a grade one strain is still painful. Like he was taught, he was moving pretty slow and you could, he said that it bothered him when he was coughing or if he sneezed. And so, you know, it, it's just going to be wild. Don't, and then really the only thing you can do is time. You know, you can do treatment. You can try and get the inflammation out and stuff, but it just takes time. So I, I think I wouldn't venture to guess he'll be back for at least three or four weeks. Oh, that's just a killer. Absolute killer. What, what are the options? That, what, how do they, what do they roll right now with then, then at shortstop while he's out? So they're they're going to use Dylan Moore primarily as the shortstop. And then they have a guy they called up named Leo Rivas. Um, to play, and he's more of a defensive first shortstop. Um, like I, I saw some people like, oh, they're gonna call up Ryan Bliss. Like Ryan Bliss can't handle the position, not right yet, not right now. I mean, like if you watched him play this spring, um, you would have seen that it's just it's a struggle. He doesn't make the routine plays, and consistently enough for the Mariners liking. That's why, you know. And talking with the Mariners even before spring training started, one of the reasons why I don't got Polanco, one of the reasons why they, you know, kind of said that Bliss wasn't really competing for a spot is because they don't think he's ready defensively. So um, until that's changed, until he gets better, um, you know, I don't know that he's going to be an option regardless of how much he hits. You know, if, they, if they're concerned about it, they could probably go out and find a, a – more viable veteran shortstop from the triple a team you know make a trade for cash you know if you remember mason mccoy a few years ago somebody like that they could do that if they think it's going to be long enough or if they're you know have an issue but right now you know they can do that with more and just play him at shortstop and and use the Rivas guy i mean it, it does speak to yeah. where 
you know, because they didn't bring up Haggerty either. You know, they, they could have brought up Haggerty instead. Sure. But like they, there is value at that position. And if they're not going to play Dylan Moore there, they're going to want somebody that they know isn't going to make mistakes at the position. They it, not trade an offense there. And, and they're not going to – What is where's Cole Young? Is he in Arkansas? Yeah, he's at Arkansas. I think that would okay. be a big ask for him right now. To come yeah, I mean, he's that. 20. I mean, you're, you're jumping up from double A, you know, which a lot of those guys do anyways nowadays. But he's 20 years old. That that would be a huge, huge leap for him. And I don't even know what he's doing down there in uh, in Arkansas. But I'm just wondering if that would be – if it got to a point where – they had to look at something like that. Would they even dip their toes into that later in the season? Like, let's just say he's out for even longer than that. Would that yeah, ever I mean, be a consideration for them? Oh, I, I think so. I mean, like, again, you know, they want it. They want Cole Young to go to triple A some, but you know, maybe yeah. that's the next level is like, if I put him at triple A here or something, or if JP were to have a recurrence, then maybe they fast track it that way. Uh, but I think that they feel like they can kind of just piece it together right now. I mean, that's why, that's why they gave, Dylan Moore a guaranteed contract, a three year extension, because they believe yep. he can handle these kinds of situations for a month. You know, I mean, it's not going to be pretty. He's not going to be JP, but you know, just play those, do it then. And like, there's a situation too where you need to move Dylan Moore to another position. Then you play the Rivas guy there. I mean, like, you know, if if the guy, I mean, like you're telling Rivas, hey, go out, play good defense. When you get up to the plate, have good at bats. If you need to bunt, we're going to tell you to bunt. Just work some walks and just play. I mean, like, I think, you know, you're not asking. It's so funny. Everybody's like, oh, you have better depth. I mean, like, who loses their stalwart starting shortstop and just says, oh, yeah, we got the depth to handle that. I mean, like, yeah, nobody. No one. Come on. Look, look no. at the Dodgers, what they did last year. You got Mookie Betts playing for shortstop for God's sakes. Like, Nobody has depth at that position except for maybe the Orioles. What um, there's some guys. I want to get into Ty France here for a quick second. He has his home. He's got his first home run yesterday, right? You know about it. His his dad's strength. Um, you know all the hard work he's put in and drive line in the off season. His average is two sixty six. All right, okay. But then you get into his slugging and OPS, and, and certainly his OPS is not where you want it right now. Uh, six seventy six there for him. I mean, he's off to, to a slow start. I mean, but do you see with your own eyes that the approach is better? The at-bats are better. It's just the hits haven't quite in the come yet and the power hasn't quite come yet. Um, Yeah, kind of. I, I think it's been better. I mean, it goes in spurts. Uh, I think, like, for the most part, it's been the contact has been pretty quality. But there are, you know, he'll go through a two-game stretch where he looks a little lost. I think he's still finding his way. You know, if you recall, like, JP did those changes. He was really bad in spring training. It took a little while for him to get going, and then it started to track. Like, like Ty said, it's like it's never finished process. It's never like because he swung one way his entire life. It's always kind of the push and pull of trying to figure out what he's going to do. And I think that's the big thing is it's like, yeah, it, it hasn't looked pretty all the time, but there have been stretches where it looks really good. And I think the more he continues to work with this, then you'll see more of the good stretches. But I, I, I kind of had. You know, I never thought uh, it fixed him immediately. I don't think that when you do these sorts of things, that it fixes you immediately. It's like it's like the defense with with um, Rojas and Urias that has been a lot better. Well, that doesn't happen overnight. Like Perry mm -hmm. Hill is not a miracle worker. It takes weeks to get that to build up to get the confidence. And I think people forget Suarez. It took him a while to kind of get to that point too. He had the bigger arm, but you know he wasn't as clean, and it took time. So I think with Ty these changes were going to take time. And I think we'll see it more, you know, in the coming weeks ahead where you know, he's had you know, 200 and some of bats. And he's going to feel it like it's more normal. Why, why can't this, t is it the curse of Edgar with them and a designated hitter? Why, why can't they find someone that can just take that damn position well, they and had run with Cruz. it? And he I know it's okay. changed. Oh, that's right. You know what? I forget about. Well, I just forget about Nelson Cruz sometimes because those teams were so bad for the most part. But I just, I mean, Mitch Garver, God bless him. I know, I know, it's only twenty games, but not what you want. I mean, his he is slugging two twenty four. Yeah, he's got as your the, designated hitter. He's not hitting the ball in the air <laughs> enough. Like if you look at the hardest hit balls, I think he's had have all been ground balls to the third baseman. I mean, he's peppering the hell out of the third baseman, getting some fungo work. But I, I mean. Like, <laughs> You know, I think that's if he's hitting the ball hard, at least to that side, there is some hope. 
you know, there's been some strikeouts and stuff. I think he's pressing a bit too, but like, I think he'll be okay. You know, and, and the one thing is, is like, look, if he's got a little bit, give him a day or two, because like, I think Mitch Hanniger needs a day at DH. I think we're seeing yeah. they ran him hard early and he looks a little, you know, he's had some issues in the outfield. He looks tired. I think they mm-hmm. need, you know, they ran him too hard too early. They need to have Hanniger at DH at least once or twice a week, just because it's just not sustainable to play him like that i know he works his ass off and i know he's in better shape than me and you but like what he has to do every day and the the way he prepares to play every day that that's a grind too so i because i thought his bat looked a little slow and it, he got robbed on a couple couple balls i mean he he nuked that one that secret caught and hit another one um, i think it was it uh, carter made the leaping catch at the wall so i just think like trying to get Hanniger a DH day every once in a while too is going to help everybody as well. What, um, and then if let's say they do that, is it, is it Rayleigh there? Can you put Canzone out there or is Luke well, Rayleigh the primary guy out. you want to throw in right field? Now? Oh no, yeah. Canzone, Canzone's that's right. He's out. Yeah. You put Rayleigh there yeah. and keep Clause in left, you know, and then yeah. kind of do it that way. I mean, I think we've seen the Clause has got a lot of talent, but he's looked a little at times, a little overwhelmed by the pitching, which they knew. I mean, like I said, I was surprised when they called him up. I can see why, you know, they like him. But at the same time, I don't know that like he's an everyday player right now. I think he needs a little more seasoning. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some odd Taylor come back the next week or two. Or if they're uh-huh. facing a run of right hand, right-handed pitching, bring back Cade Marlowe, you know, a left-handed hitter or something like that. Or Haggard, you know, uh-huh. like, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw any of those guys, you know, in the coming weeks. Just because, like, it's a lot for Clause A. You know, there are a lot of good things that he does, but at the same time, you know, there are times where he looks a little like over his skis because he is a young player. You noted it in in your story of the Seattle Times uh, here on Friday, uh, you know, post that start there from Castillo. I mean, the first few games of the season, not good, but what is it, the last three starts now? He's got a sub, you know, two ERA. He's looking like the Luis Castillo we've we've come to to love. It's a hell of a nice turnaround there for him in these last three starts. Yeah, I think so. And I think they had, you know, there were some conversations, and I think a certain catcher may have had some hard conversations with him too about, <laughs> you know, how to miss out, you know, like, look, it's, it just harness it. You know, you got to find a way. Tell yourself you're going to miss out of the zone. Don't let, you know, and they've had that same conversation with George for different reasons. But I think, you know, and, and it's, it's funny. It was like, I mean, Castillo is kind of like, you know, we always joke Castillo is like, Ron Burgundy, if you if you put it on the teleprompter, he will read it. We always joke that Riz would read it if it's in the game notes. Um, but you know, with Castillo, he's or Riz, leave Riz alone. But uh, I think they actually got Simsy on that too on an April day, April Fool's Day one on that. But oh yeah, I could Castillo see that. Castillo's gonna Castillo's not gonna shake, you know. But what it, sometimes it's not just the pitch that you put down, but it's the intent of the pitch, and I think. Yeah. You know, Cal talked to him and pitching staff talked to him about the intent of certain pitches with two strikes. You know, this is what we need to do. This is where it needs to be. If you're going to miss, miss it down, miss it out. We don't care. You know? But I think sometimes he gets caught, you know, he gets rolling and his stuff is so good that he thinks, well, it doesn't really matter. They're not going to touch him. You know, same with Kirby. Like Kirby always says, well, I'll beat him in the zone with my fastball. That's fine. This isn't, you know, a, uh, this isn't a maturity measuring contest you know or a manhood measuring contest of beating him in the zone with your fastball sometimes it's just smarter to throw it out of the zone and let him chase than trying to prove that you can beat them with your fastball. you know what man uh we we talked about him i think on wednesday but gabe spire just continues to be a stud man just dirty an absolute just dirty stud. Corey Seager. did God. you see the look on Seeger's face oh. he was so oh, yeah. in his own head I mean, he went hitless in that It's series. just great. How many times do you think they've held Corey Seager? Yeah. Sit hitless. And now he hit some rockets, and they caught him. But, like, you know, in a leveraged moment, Spire executed a pitch. And it was funny, if you watch the replay, like, Urias is at third, bringing him up before the umpire could. Like, he's making the signal. Like, uh, bring him up. Well, I like Jonah. He- was it Heim that was on third? Yeah. Yeah, he just kind of and he down like away. he just get the little facial expression. He's like, oh my god. But yeah, he's Gabe Spire's been great. He's just he's fun to watch. He goes out there, just battles, competes, and just goes right after guys. I mean, uh, fifteen like strikeouts, us. two walks. 
body yeah, like that's what I like scene. about him. Yeah. yeah, he looks like us. He looks like one of us. Yeah, like you saw, you saw Gabe Spire in an airport. You're thinking construction worker because he's got the tats and everything like that. You know, you're thinking he puts on a, a fluorescent yellow work vest and is out there yeah. holding a the sign. You know, like I can see that. I I, I envision him and Miller being best friends. Uh yeah, Bryce is best friends with everybody. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just had some. I can see those guys. The game gets over, or if this was back in like the seventies or eighties, I could see those guys ripping a couple reds in the dugout. Oh yeah, Marlboro they just kind of come. They, they cores yeah. cores original. You know, not, not yeah, white. of course. They don't really you ever ha have you ever had a marble red? Come on, look at this. I, <laughs> I know the exact time date place where i had my last marble red it was after a mariners game this is this is this is 10 plus years ago i am this post game show's over for some reason i'm taking the bus home i don't know why i'm taking the bus home leaving living up in greenwood for some reason taking the 358 which connects over there by by junkie park for some reason i'm on that it's like 12 30 at night i've had a couple of cocktails after the post game show some guys there and like, Hey, you got a, you got a smoke on you. Oh yeah. And of course he pulls out a, you know, Marlboro reds and I'm like, Oh my God. And now I'm like, well, I can't say no. Cause he's giving it to me. And I'm like, okay, I'll take one of those three, three drags. And I was done. Just, I mean, Oh, I, I don't, terrible. I never, I never smoked, but I remember my last dip, I think. And it was Oof. pretty magical. And I find myself, even when I'm driving down the highway, reaching for my pocket trying to grab one because like there's nothing that's the only time i yeah it's the only time i i i, I dip in you know I, I dip into that uh into that world is when or i'm long drives golfing you know if you're drinking beer yeah, and sometimes you're golfing, golfing sometimes oh, golfing. Man, yeah. it was i, I miss it's it good times it's good for it. you all right i'm no, gonna no cut you loose here when you have that <laughs> well that's true and that's what it, they should sell it my on. dad my dad never allowed spitters so like he, if he goes if you're gonna if you're gonna chew the snooze you swallow the juice. Oh, and I'm like, what? Just, so, oh, yeah, God, so no. I yeah, you could never spit in front of him. No spitters. Ooh. Uh, on that note, okay. <laughs> please subscribe, like, comment below on the YouTube. Of course, uh, follow it and like and subscribe and comment away on Apple, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. Ryan Divish, every single Wednesday and Friday, brought to you by chalet bowl all right Deb. we'll talk to you next wednesday yeah take it easy